Introduction to a Slav Soul and Other Stories by Alexander Kuprin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. Introduction Alexander Kuprin. Oh, how incomprehensible for us, how mysterious, how strange are the very simplest happenings in life! and we, not understanding them, unable to penetrate their significance, heap one event upon another, plate them together, join them, make acquaintances and marriages, write books, say sermons, found ministries, carry on war or trade, make new inventions, and then, after all, create history. And yet, every time I think of the immensity and complexity, the incomprehensible and elemental accidentalness of the whole hurly-burly of life, then my own little life seems but a miserable speck of dust, lost in the whirl of a hurricane. So, in a paragraph, in one of his sketches, Alexander Kuprin gives his feelings about his life and his work, and in that expression, perhaps, we see his characteristic attitude towards the world of which he writes one of the strongest tales in this collection tempting providence is very representative of kuprin in this vein after chekhov the most popular tale writer in russia is kuprin the author of fourteen volumes of effusive touching and humorous stories he is read by the great mass of the russian reading public and his works can be bought at any railway bookstall in the empire he is devoured by the students, loved by the bourgeois, and admired even by intellectual and fastidious Russians. It is impossible not to admire this natural torrent of Russian thoughts and words and sentiments. His lively pages are a reflection of Russia herself, and without having been once in the country it would be possible to get a fair notion of its surface life by reading these tales in translation. Perhaps the greatest of living Russian novelists is Kuprin, exalted, hysterical, sentimental, Rabelaisian Kuprin. He comes to you with a handful of wild flowers in one red, hairy hand, and a shovelful of rubbish in the other, his shiny, lacrimose but unfathomable features, pouring floods of tears or rolling and bursting in guffaws of laughter. His is a rank verbiage. He gives birth to words, ideas, examples in tens, where other writers go by units and threes. He is occasionally coarse, occasionally sentimental, but he gives great delight to his readers. His are rough-hewn lumps of conversation and life. With him everything is taken from life. He seems to be a master of detail, and the characteristic of his style is a tendency to give the most diverting lists often paragraph after paragraph, if you look into the style, would be found to be lists of delicious details reported in a conversational manner. Thus, opening a volume at random, you can easily find an example. Imagine the village we had reached, all overblown with snow. The inevitable village idiot, Sarosha, walking almost naked in the snow. The priest, who won't play cards the day before a festival, but writes denunciations to the village starosta instead, a stupid, artful man, and an adept at getting alms, speaking an atrocious Petersburg Russian. If you have grasped what society was like in the village, you know to what point of boredom and stupefaction we attained. We had already got tired of bear-hunting, hare-hunting with hounds, pistol-shooting at a target through three rooms, writing humorous verses. It must be confessed, we quarrelled. He is also the inventor of amusing sentences which can almost be used as proverbs. He knew which end of the asparagus to eat. Or, we looked at our neighbours through a microscope, they at us through a telescope. Every one of Kuprin's stories has the necessary attic salt. He is like our English Kipling, whom he greatly admires, and about whom he has written in one of his books an appreciative essay. He is also something like the American O. Henry, especially in the matter of his lists of details and his apt metaphors, but he is not the artifice nor the everlasting American smile. 
Kuprin, moreover, takes his matter from life, and writes with great ease and carelessness. O. Henry put together from life, and rewrote twelve times. Above all things Kuprin is a sentimental author, preferring an impulse to a reason, and abandoning logic whenever his feelings are touched. He likes to feel the reader with the tears in his eyes, and then to go forward with him in the unity of emotional friendship. There is, however, under this excitement a rather self-centred cynic despising the things he does not love, a satirical genius. His humour is nearly always at the expense of some person, institution or class of society. Thus, the song and the dance is at the expense of the peasantry, the last word at the expense of the lower intelligentsia, the white poodle at the expense of those rich bourgeois who have villas on the Crimean shores, anathema at the expense of the church, mechanical justice at the expense of the professor, and so on and it is a part of Kuprin's sentiment to love dogs almost as much as men, and he tells no tales at dog's expense. The White Poodle and Dog's Happiness are two of his dog tales. The tales selected are taken from various volumes, and two of them, The Elephant and The White Poodle, from a volume specially designed by him for reading aloud to children. They are in very simple and colloquial and humorous Russian, and are delightful to read aloud. Kuprin, who is a living Russian tale-writer, though considerably less productive than in his earlier years, spent a great deal of time in the Crimea, which is evidently favourite country to him. Chekhov also lived in the Crimea, and tended lovingly his rose-garden at Yalta. His neighbour, Kuprin, wrote one of the most charming reminiscent essays on Chekhov and his life in To the Glory of the Living and the Dead, which also contains the Kipling essay. Many of Kuprin's stories relate to the Crimea, and the longest of these, given in this selection, contains a description of Crimean life, and gives a wonderful impression of a Crimean summer night. Kuprin has also lived in England, and has written tales of London life and has occasional references to English characteristics. But I have avoided carrying coals to Newcastle. As compared with Sologub, whose volume of beautiful tales, The Sweet-Scented Name, has found so many friends in England, Kuprin may be said to be nearer to the earth, less in the clouds. He is a satirical realist, whereas Sologub is a fantastic realist. Sologub discloses the devils and the angels in men and women, but Kuprin is cheerfully human. Both have a certain satirical genius, but Kuprin is read by everyone, whereas it would be hardly one in ten that could follow Sologub. In comparison with Chekhov, I should say Kuprin was a little more inventive, and as regards a picture of life, Kuprin is nearer to the present moment. Nearly all these Russian tale-writers excel in describing the life of townspeople. Very little study of the peasantry has been made, though there are one or two notable exceptions. Kuprin made his name in writing stories of life in the Russian army. He did not describe the common soldier as did his likeness, Kipling, but rather the life of the officers. His most famous books on the subject are Cadets, Staff Captain Ribnikov, and The Duel. He extended his popularity with somewhat lurid and oleographic descriptions of the night haunt and night life, and wrote the notorious novel, lately completed, entitled Yama, The Pit. He has written a great deal about the relationship of men and women. His weakness is the subject of women. Whenever they come into question, he becomes self-conscious and awkward, putting his subject in the wrong light, protesting too much, and finally writing that which is not fitting, just because all is permitted, and why shouldn't we? His poorest work is his coarse work. Nothing ugly is worth reproducing, however curious the ugliness may be. We do not want the ugly, and are interested more in brightest Russia than in darkest Russia. My purpose is to give what is beautiful, or, in any case, what is interesting but not ugly, in the living Russian literature of today. Consequently, I have made, together with my wife, a choice of Kuprin. We have read all his stories through, and taken fifteen of those which make him a great writer, 
just those which should enrich us here is Kuprin's humour, sentiment, pathos, and delightful and entertaining verbosity. Of this work all but three tales were translated by my wife, and these three by myself. I have communicated the contents to Kuprin, who sanctions the publication. Stephen Graham, London, 1916 End of Introduction Story One of a Slav Soul and Other Stories by Alexander Kuprin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Slav Soul. The farther I go back in my memory of the past, and the nearer I get to remembering incidents connected with my childhood, the more confused and doubtful do my recollections become. Much, no doubt, was told me afterwards, in a more conscious state of my existence, by those who, with loving care, noticed my early doings. Perhaps many of the things I recall never happened to me. I heard or read them some time or other, and their remembrance grew to be part of myself. Who can guarantee which of these recollections are of real facts, and which of tales told so long ago that they have all the appearance of truth? who can know where one ends and the other begins. My imagination recalls with special vividness the eccentric figure of Yasha, and the two companions, might almost call them friends, who accompanied him along the path of life, Matsko, an old rejected cavalry horse, and the yard-dog Bouton. Yasha was distinguished by the deliberate slowness of his speech and actions, and he always had the air of a man whose thoughts were concentrated on himself. He spoke very seldom and considered his speech. He tried to speak good Russian, though at times when he was moved he would burst out in his native dialect of little Russian. Owing to his dress of a dark colour and sober cut, and to the solemn and almost melancholy expression of his shaven face and thin pursed lips, he always gave the impression that he was an old servant of a noble family of the good old times. Of all the human beings that he knew, Yasha seemed to find my father the only one besides himself worthy of his veneration. And though to us children, to my mother, and to all our family and friends, his manner was respectful, it was mingled with a certain pity and slighting condescension. It was always an enigma to me, whence came this immeasurable pride of his. Servants have often a well-known form of insolence. They take upon themselves some of that attractive authority which they have noticed in their masters. But my father, a poor doctor in a little Jewish village, lived so modestly and quietly that Yasha could never have learnt from him to look down upon his neighbours and in Yasha himself there was none of the ordinary insolence of a servant. He had no metropolitan polish, and could not overawe people by using foreign words. He had no overbearing manners toward country chambermaids, no gentle art of tinkling out touching romances on the guitar, an art by which so many inexperienced souls have been ruined. He occupied his leisure hours in lying in sheer idleness full length on the box in which he kept his belongings. He not only did not read books, but he sincerely despised them. All things written, except in the Bible, were, in his opinion, written not for truth's sake, but just to get money, and he therefore preferred to any book those long rambling thoughts which he turned over in his mind as he lay idly on his bed. Matsko, the horse, had been rejected from military service on account of many vices, the chief of which was that he was old, far too old. Then his forelegs were crooked, and at the places where they joined the body were adorned with bladder-like growths. He strutted on his hind legs like a cock. He held his head like a camel, and from old military habit tossed it upward, and thrust his long neck forward. This combined with his enormous size and unusual leanness, and the fact that he had only one eye, gave him a pitiful warlike and serio-comic expression. Such horses are called in the regiment star-gazers. Yasha prized Matsko much more than Bouton, 
who sometimes displayed a frivolity entirely out of keeping with his size. He was one of those shaggy, long-haired dogs who, at times, remind one of ferrets, but being ten times as large, they sometimes look like poodles. They are by nature the very breed for yard dogs. At home Bhutan was always overwhelmingly serious and sensible in all his ways, but in the streets his behaviour was positively disgraceful. If he went out with my father, he would never run modestly behind the carriage as a well-behaved dog should do. He would rush to meet all other dogs, jump about them, and bark loudly in their very noses, only springing away to one side in a fright if one of them, with a snort of alarm, bent his head quickly and tried to bite him. He ran into other people's yards and came tearing out again after a second or so, chased by a dozen angry dogs of the place. He wandered about on terms of deepest friendship with dogs of a known bad reputation. In our district of Podolia and Bohynia, nothing was thought so much of as a person's way of setting out from his house. The squire might long since have mortgaged and remortgaged his estate, and be only waiting for the officers of the crown to take possession of his property, but let him only on a Sunday go out to Holy Church. It must be in a light tarantas drawn by four or six splendid fiery Polish horses, and drive into the market square of the village, he must cry to the coachman, Lay on with the whip, Joseph! Yet I am sure that none of our rich neighbours started off in such pomp as Yasha was able to impart to our equipage when my father made up his mind to journey forth. Yasha would put on a shining hat with a shade in front and behind, and a broad yellow belt. Then the carriage would be taken out about a hundred yards from the house, an antique coach of the old Polish days, and Matsko put in. Hardly would my father show himself at the house door, than Yasha would give a magnificent crack with his whip, Matsko would wave his tail some time in hesitation, and then start at a sober trot, flinging out and raising his hind legs, and strutting like a cock. Coming level with the house door, Yasha would pretend that only with great difficulty could he restrain the impatient horses, stretching out both his arms and pulling back the reins with all his might all his attention would seem to be swallowed up by the horses, and whatever might happen elsewhere round about him, Yasha would never turn his head. Probably he did all this to sustain our family honour. Yasha had an extraordinarily high opinion of my father. It would happen upon occasion that some poor Jew or peasant would be waiting his turn in the ante-room while my father was occupied with another patient. Yasha would often enter into a conversation with him, with the simple object of increasing my father's popularity as a doctor. "'What do you think?' he would ask, taking up a position of importance on a stool, and surveying the patient before him from head to foot. "'Perhaps you fancy that coming to my master is like asking medical advice of the clerk at the village police station. My master not only stands higher than such a one, brother, but higher than the chief of police himself. He knows about everything in the world, my brother. Yes, he does. Now, what's the matter with you? There's something wrong with my inside, the sick person would say. My chest burns. Ah, you see what causes that? What will cure you? You don't know, and I don't. But my master will only throw a glance at you, and he'll tell you at once whether you'll live or die. Yasha lived very economically, and he spent his money in buying various things which he carefully stored away in his large, tin-bound wooden trunk. Nothing gave us children greater pleasure than for Yasha to let us look on while he turned out these things. On the inside of the lid of the trunk were pasted pictures of various kinds. There, side by side with portraits of terrifying green-whiskered generals who had fought for the fatherland, were pictures of martyrs, engravings from the Neva, studies of women's heads, and fairy-tale pictures of the robber swallow in an oak, opening wide his right eye to receive the arrow of Ilya Muromets. 
Yasha would bring out from the trunk a whole collection of coats, waistcoats, topcoats, fur caps, cups and saucers, wire boxes ornamented with false pearls and with transfer pictures of flowers, and little circular mirrors. Sometimes, from a side pocket of the trunk, he would bring out an apple or a couple of buns strewn with poppy seed, which we always found especially appetizing. Yasha was usually very precise and careful. Once he broke a large decanter, and my father scolded him for it. The next day Yasha appeared with two new decanters. "'I dare say I shall break another one,' he explained. "'And anyhow, we can find a use for the two somehow.' He kept all the rooms of the house in perfect cleanliness and order. He was very jealous of all his rights and duties, and he was firmly convinced that no one could clean the floors as well as he. At one time he had a great quarrel with a new housemaid, Yevka, as to which of them could clean out a room better. We were called in as expert judges, and in order to please Yasha a little, we gave the palm to Yevka. But children, as we were, we didn't know the human soul and we little suspected what a cruel blow this was to Yasha. He went out of the room without saying a word, and next day everybody in the village knew that Yasha was drunk. Yasha used to get drunk about two or three times a year, and these were times of great unhappiness for him and for all the family. There was nobody then to chop wood, to feed the horses, to bring in water. For five or six days we lost sight of Yasha and heard nothing of his doings. On the seventh day he came back without hat or coat and in a dreadful condition. A crowd of noisy Jews followed about thirty paces behind him, and ragged urchins called names after him and made faces. They all knew that Yasha was going to hold an auction. Yasha came into the house, and then in a minute or so ran out again into the street, carrying in his arms almost all the contents of his trunk. The crowd came round him quickly. "'How's that? You won't give me any more vodka, won't you?' he shouted, shaking out trousers and waistcoats, and holding them up in his hands. "'What? I haven't any more money, eh? How much for this, and this, and this?' And one after another he flung his garments among the crowd, who snatched at them with tens of rapacious fingers. "'How much'll you give?' Yasha shouted to one of the Jews who had possessed himself of a coat. "'How much'll you give, mare's head?' "'Well, I'll give you fifty kopecks,' drawled the Jew, his eyes staring. Fifty kopecks? Fifty? Yasha seemed to fall into a frenzy of despair. "'I don't want fifty kopecks. Why not say twenty? Give me gold. What's this? Towels?' give me ten kopecks for the lot, eh? Oh, that you had died of fever! Oh, that you had died when you were young!" Our village has its policeman, but his duties consist mainly in standing as godfather to the farmer's children, and on such an occasion as this the police took no share in quelling the disorder, but acted the part of a modest and silent looker-on. But my father, seeing the plunder of Yasha's property, could no longer restrain his rage and contempt. "'He's got drunk again, the idiot, and now he'll lose all his goods,' said he, unselfishly hurling himself into the crowd. In a second the people were gone, and he found himself alone with Yasha, holding in his hands some pitiful-looking razor-case or other. Yasha staggered in astonishment, helplessly raising his eyebrows, and then he suddenly fell heavily on his knees. "'Master, my own dear master, see what they've done to me!' "'Go off into the shed,' ordered my father angrily, pulling himself away from Yasha, who had seized the tail of his coat and was kissing it. "'Go into the shed and sleep off your drunkenness, so that tomorrow even the smell of you may be gone.' Yasha went away humbly into the shed, and then began for him those tormenting hours of getting sober, the deep and oppressive torture of repentance. He lay on his stomach and rested his head on the palms of his hands, staring fixedly at some point in front of him. He knew perfectly well what was taking place in the house. He could picture to himself how we were all begging my father to forgive him, and how my father would impatiently wave his hands and refuse to listen. 
he knew very well that probably this time my father would be implacable every now and then we children would be impelled by curiosity to go and listen at the door of the shed and we would hear strange sounds as of bellowing and sobbing in such times of affliction and degradation bouton counted it his moral duty to be in attendance upon the suffering yasha the sagacious creature knew very well that ordinarily when yasha was sober he would never be allowed to show any sign of familiarity towards him whenever he met the stern figure of yasha in the yard bouton would put on an air of gazing attentively into the distance of being entirely occupied in snapping at flies we children used to fondle bouton and feed him occasionally we used to pull the burrs out of his shaggy coat while he stood in patient endurance we even used to kiss him on his cold wet nose and i always wondered that bouton's sympathy and devotion used to be given entirely to yasha from whom he seemed to get nothing but kicks now alas when bitter experience has taught me to look all round and on the other side of things i begin to suspect that the source of bouton's devotion was not really enigmatical it was yasha who fed bouton every day and brought him his dish of scraps after dinner in ordinary times i say bouton would never have risked forcing himself upon yasha's attention but in these days of repentance he went daringly into the shed and planted himself by the side of yasha staring into a corner and breathing deeply and sympathetically if this seemed to do no good he would begin to lick his patron's face and hands timidly at first but afterwards boldly and more boldly it would end by yasha putting his arms around bouton's neck and sobbing then bouton would insinuate himself by degrees under yasha's body and the voices of the two would mingle in a strange and touching duet next day yasha came into the house at early dawn gloomy and downcast he cleaned the floor and the furniture and put everything into a state of shining cleanliness ready for the coming of my father the very thought of whom made yasha tremble but my father was not to be appeased he handed yasha his wages and his passport and ordered him to leave the place at once prayers and oaths of repentance were vain then yasha resolved to take extreme measures so it means you're sending me away sir does it he asked boldly yes and at once well then i won't go you send me away now and you'll simply all die off like beetles i won't go i'll stay years i shall send for the policeman to take you off take me off said yasha in amazement well let him all the town knows that i've served you faithfully for twenty years and then i'm sent off by the police let them take me it won't be shame to me but to you sir and yasha really stayed on threats had no effect upon him he paid no attention to them but worked untiringly in an exaggerated way trying to make up for lost time that night he didn't go into the kitchen to sleep but lay down in matsko's stall and the horse stood up all night afraid to move and unable to be down in his accustomed place my father was a good-natured and indolent man who easily submitted himself to surrounding circumstances and to people and things with which he was familiar by the evening he had forgiven yasha yasha was a handsome man of a fair little russian melancholy type young men and girls looked admiringly at him but not one of them running like a quail across the yard would have dared to give him a playful punch in the side or even an inviting smile there was too much haughtiness in him and icy contempt for the fair sex and the delights of a family hearth seemed to have little attraction for him when a woman establishes herself in a cottage he used to say intolerantly the air becomes bad at once however he did once make a move in that direction and then he surprised us more than ever before we were seated at tea one evening when yasha came into the dining-room he was perfectly sober but his face wore a look of agitation and pointing mysteriously with his thumb over his shoulder towards the door he asked in a whisper can i bring them in who is it asked father let them come in all eyes were turned in expectation towards the door 
from behind which there crept a strange being. It was a woman of over fifty years of age, ragged, drunken, degraded and foolish-looking. "'Give us your blessing, sir. We are going to be married,' said Yasha, dropping on his knees. "'Get down on your knees, fool!' cried he, addressing the woman and pulling her roughly by the sleeve. My father with difficulty overcame his astonishment. He talked to Yasha long and earnestly, and told him he must be going out of his mind to think of marrying such a creature. Yasha listened in silence, not getting up from his knees. The silly woman knelt, too, all the time. "'So you don't allow us to marry, sir?' asked Yasha at last. "'Not only do I not allow you, but I'm quite sure you won't do such a thing,' answered my father. "'That means that I won't,' said Yasha resolutely. "'Get up, you fool,' said he, turning to the woman. "'You hear what the master says. Go away at once.' And with these words he hauled the unexpected guest away by the collar, and they both went quickly out of the room. This was the only attempt Yasha made towards the state of matrimony. Each of us explained the affair to ourselves in our own way, but we never understood it fully, for whenever we asked Yasha further about it, he only waved his hands in vexation. Still more mysterious and unexpected was his death. It happened so suddenly and enigmatically, and had apparently so little connection with any previous circumstance in Yasha's life, that if I were forced to recount what happened, I feel I couldn't do it at all well. Yet all the same, I am confident that what I say really took place, and that none of the clear impression of it is at all exaggerated. One day, in the railway station three versts from the village, a certain well-dressed young man, a passenger from one of the trains, hanged himself in a lavatory. Yasha at once asked my father if he might go and see the body. Four hours later he returned and went straight into the dining-room, we had visitors at the time, and stood by the door. It was only two days after one of his drinking bouts and repentance in the shed, and he was quite sober. "'What is it?' asked my mother. Yasha suddenly burst into a guffaw. "'He, he, he,' said he. "'His tongue was all hanging out. The gentleman—' My father ordered him into the kitchen. Our guests talked a little about Yasha's idiosyncrasies, and then soon forgot about the little incident. Next day, about eight o'clock in the evening, Yasha went up to my little sister in the nursery and kissed her. "'Good-bye, Missy.' "'Good-bye, Yasha.' answered the little one, not looking up from her doll. Half an hour later, Yevka, the housemaid, ran into my father's study, pale and trembling. "'Oh, sir, there, in the attic, he's hanged himself, Yasha!' And she fell down in a swoon. On a nail in the attic hung the lifeless body of Yasha. When the coroner questioned the cook, she said that Yasha's manner had been very strange on the day of his death. He stood before the looking-glass, said she, and pressed his hands so tightly round his neck that his face went quite red and his tongue stuck out and his eyes bulged. He must have been seeing what he would look like. The coroner brought in a verdict of suicide while in a state of unsound mind. Yasha was buried in a special grave dug for the purpose in the ravine on the other side of the wood. Next day Bouton could not be found anywhere. The faithful dog had run off to the grave, and lay there howling, mourning the death of his austere friend. Afterwards he disappeared, and we never saw him again. And now that I myself am nearly what may be called an old man, I go over my varied recollections now and then, and when I come to the thought of Yasha, every time I say to myself, What a strange soul! Faithful, pure, contradictory, absurd! and great. Was it not a truly Slav soul that dwelt in the body of Yasha? End of Story 1 Story 2 of A Slav Soul and Other Stories by Alexander Kuprin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Song and the Dance 
we lived at that time in the government of Riazan, some one hundred twenty versts from the nearest railway station, and even twenty-five versts from the large trading village of Tuma. Tuma is iron, and its people are of stone, as the local inhabitants say of themselves. We lived in an old untenanted estate, where, in 1812, an immense house of wood had been constructed to accommodate the French prisoners. The house had columns, and a park with lime trees had been made around it to remind the prisoners of Versailles. Imagine our comical situation. There were twenty-three rooms at our disposal, but only one of them had a stove and was warmed, and even in that room it was so cold that water froze in it in the early morning, and the door was frosted at the fastenings. The post came sometimes once a week, sometimes once in two months, and was brought by a chance peasant, generally an old man with the packet under his shaggy snow-strewn coat, the addresses wet and smudged, the backs unsealed and stuck again by inquisitive postmasters. Around us was an ancient pine wood where bears prowled, and whence even in broad daylight the hungry wolves sallied forth and snatched away yawning dogs from the street of the hamlet near by. The local population spoke in a dialect we did not understand, now in a sing-song drawl, now coughing and hooting, and they stared at us surlily and without restraint. They were firmly convinced that the forest belonged to God and the Muzhik alone, and the lazy German steward only knew how much wood they stole. There was at our service a splendid French library of the eighteenth century, though all the magnificent bindings were mouse-eaten. There was an old portrait gallery with the canvases ruined from damp, mould, and smoke. Picture to yourself the neighbouring hamlet all overblown with snow, and the inevitable village idiot, Serosia, who goes naked even in the coldest weather. The priest who does not play preference on a fast day, but writes denunciations to the starosta, a stupid, artful man, diplomat and beggar, speaking in a dreadful Petersburg accent. If you see all this, you understand to what a degree of boredom we attained. We grew tired of encompassing bears, of hunting hares with hounds, of shooting with pistols at a target through three rooms at a distance of twenty-five paces, of writing humorous verses in the evening. Of course we quarrelled. Yes, if you had asked us individually why we had come to this place, I should think not one of us would have answered the question. I was painting at that time. Valerian Alexandrovitch wrote symbolical verses, and Vaska amused himself with Wagner and played Tristan and Isolde on the old, ruined, yellow-keyed clavicordia. But about Christmas time the village began to enliven, and in all the little clearings round about, in Tristenka, in Borodina, Breslina, Shustova, Nikiforskaya, and Kosli, the peasants began to brew beer such thick beer that it stained your hands and face at the touch, like lime-bark. There was so much drunkenness among the peasants, even before the festival, that in Dagileva a son broke his father's head, and in Kruglisti an old man drank himself to death. But Christmas was a diversion for us. We started paying the customary visits and offering congratulations to all the local officials and peasants of our acquaintance. First we went to the priest, then to the psalm-singer of the church, then to the church watchman, then to two schoolmistresses. After the schoolmistresses we fared more pleasantly. We turned up at the doctor's at Tuma, then trooped off to the district clerk, where a real banquet awaited us, then to the policeman, then to the lame apothecary, then to the local peasant tyrant, who had grown rich and held a score of other peasants in his own grasp and possessed all the cord, linen, grain, wood, whips in the neighbourhood, and we went and went on. It must be confessed, however, that we felt a little awkward now and then. We couldn't manage to get into the tempo of the life there. We were really out of it. This life had creamed and mantled for years without number. In spite of our peasant manners and apparent ease, we were, all the same, people from another planet, then there was a disparity in our mutual estimation of one another. We looked at them as through a microscope, they at us as through a telescope. 
Certainly we made attempts to accommodate ourselves, and when the psalm singer's servant, a woman of forty, with warty hands all chocolate colour from the reins of the horse she put in the sledge, when she went with a bucket to the well, sang of an evening, and we did what we thought we ought to do. She would look ashamed, lower her eyes, fold her arms, and sing. Andrei Nikolaevitch, we have come to you, we wish to trouble you, but we have come, and please to take the one of us you love. Then we would boldly make to kiss her on the lips, which we did in spite of feigned resistance and screams. And we would make a circle. One day there were a lot of us there, four students on holiday from an ecclesiastical college, the psalm-singer, a housekeeper from a neighbouring estate, the two schoolmistresses, the policeman in his uniform, the deacon, the local horse-doctor, and we three aesthetes. We went round and round in a dance, and sang, roared, swinging now this way, now that, and the lion of the company, a student named Vodvizhensky, stood in the middle and ordered our movements, dancing himself the while, and snapping his fingers over his head. The queen was in the town, yes, the town, and the prince, the little prince, ran away. Found a bride, did the prince, found a bride. She was nice, yes, she was, she was nice, and a ring got the prince for her, a ring. After a while the giddy whirl of the dance came to an end, and we stopped and began to sing to one another in solemn tones. The royal gates were opened, bowed the king to the queen, and the queen to the king, but lower bowed the queen. And then the horse-doctor and the psalm-singer had a competition as to who should bow lower to the other. Our visiting continued, and at last came to the schoolhouse at Tuma. That was inevitable, since there had been long rehearsals of an entertainment which the children were going to give entirely for our benefit, Petersburg guests. We went in. The Christmas tree was lit simultaneously by a touch-paper. As for the programme, I knew it by heart before we went in. There were several little tableaus, illustrative of songs of the countryside. It was all poorly done, but it must be confessed that one six-year-old might, playing the part of a peasant, wearing a huge cap of dog-skin, and his father's great leather gloves with only places for hand and thumb, was delightful, with his serious face and hoarse little bass voice. A born artist! The remainder was very disgusting, all done in the false popular style. I had long been familiar with the usual entertainment items, little Russian songs mispronounced to an impossible point, verses and silly embroidery patterns. There's a Christmas tree, there's Petrushka, there's a horse, there's a steam engine. The teacher, a little consumptive fellow, got up for the occasion in a long frock coat and stiff shirt, played the fiddle in fits and starts, or beat time with his bow, or tapped a child on the head with it now and then. The honorary guardian of the school, a notary from another town, chewed his gums all the time and stuck out his short parrot's tongue with sheer delight, feeling that the whole show had been got up in his honour. At last the teacher got to the most important item on his programme. We had laughed up till then, our turn was coming to weep. A little girl of twelve or thirteen came out, the daughter of a watchman, her face, by the way, not at all like his horse-like profile. She was the top girl in the school, and she began her little song. The jumping little grasshopper sang the summer through, never once considering how the winter would blow in his eyes. Then a shaggy little boy of seven, in his father's felt boots, took up his part, addressing the watchman's daughter. That's strange, neighbour. Didn't you work in the summer? What was there to work for? There was plenty of grass. Where was our famous Russian hospitality? To the question, what did you do in the summer, the grasshopper could only reply, I sang all the time. At this answer the teacher, Kapitonich, waved his bow and his fiddle at one and the same time. Oh, that was an effect rehearsed long before that evening, and suddenly, in a mysterious half-whisper, the whole choir began to sing. You've sung your song, you call that doing? You've sung all the summer, then dance all the winter. 
you've sung your song then dance all the winter dance all the winter dance all the winter you've sung the song then dance the dance i confess that my hair stood on end as if each individual hair were made of glass and it seemed to me as if the eyes of the children and of the peasants packing the schoolroom were all fixed on me as if repeating that damned phrase you've sung the song you call that doing you've sung the song then dance the dance i don't know how long this drone of evil boding and sinister recitation went on but i remember clearly that during those minutes an appalling idea went through my brain here we stand thought i a little band of intelligentsia face to face with an innumerable peasantry the most enigmatical the greatest and the most abased people in the world what connects us with them nothing neither language nor religion nor labour nor art our poetry would be ridiculous to their ears absurd incomprehensible our refined painting would be simply useless and senseless smudging in their eyes our quest for gods and making of gods would seem to them stupidity our music merely a tedious noise our science would not satisfy them our complex work would seem laughable or pitiful to them the austere and patient labourers of the fields yes on the dreadful day of reckoning what answer shall we give to this child wild beast wise man and animal to this many million headed giant we shall only be able to say sorrowfully we sang all the time we sang our song and he will reply with an artful peasant smile then go and dance the dance and i know that my companions felt as i did we went out of the entertainment room silent not exchanging opinions three days later we said good-bye and since that time have been rather cold towards one another we had been suddenly chilled in our consciences and made ashamed as if these innocent mouths of sleepy children had pronounced death sentence upon us and when i returned from the post of ivan karaulov to gorelli and from gorelli to koslov and from koslov to zintambrov and then further by railroad there followed me all the time that ironical seemingly malicious phrase then dance the dance god alone knows the destiny of the russian people well i suppose if it should be necessary we'll dance it i travelled a whole night to the railway station on the bare frosted branches of the birches sat the stars as if the lord himself had with his own hands decorated the trees and i thought yes it's beautiful but i could not banish that ironical thought then dance the dance end of story two story three of a slav soul and other stories by alexander kuprin this librivox recording is in the public domain easter day on his way from petersburg to the crimea colonel voznitsin purposely broke his journey at moscow where his childhood and youth had been spent and stayed there two days it is said that some animals when they feel that they are about to die go round to all their favourite and familiar haunts taking leave of them as it were voznitsin was not threatened by the near approach of death at forty years of age he was still strong and well preserved but in his tastes and feelings and in his relations with the world he had reached the point from which life slips almost imperceptibly into old age he had begun to narrow the circle of his enjoyments and pleasures a habit of retrospection and of sceptical suspicion was manifest in his behaviour his dumb unconscious animal love of nature had become less and was giving place to a more refined appreciation of the shades of beauty he was no longer agitated and disturbed by the adorable loveliness of women but chiefly and this was the first sign of spiritual blight he began to think about his own death formerly he had thought about it in a careless and transient fashion sooner or later death would come not to him personally but to some other someone of the name of voznitsin but now he thought of it with a grievous sharp cruel unwavering merciless clearness 
so that at nights his heart beat in terror and his blood ran cold. It was this feeling which had impelled him to visit once more those places familiar to his youth, to live over again in memory those dear, painfully sweet recollections of his childhood, overshadowed with a poetical sadness, to wound his soul once more with the sweet grief of recalling that which was for ever past, the irrevocable purity and clearness of his first impressions of life. And so he did. He stayed two days in Moscow, returning to his old haunts. He went to see the boarding-house, where once he had lived for six years in the charge of his former mistress, being educated under the Freibelian system. Everything there was altered and reconstituted. The boys' department no longer existed, but in the girls' classrooms there was still the pleasant and alluring smell of freshly varnished tables and stools. There was still the marvellous mixture of odours in the dining-room, with a special smell of the apples which now, as then, the scholars hid in their private cupboards. He visited his old military school, and went into the private chapel where, as a cadet, he used to serve at the altar, swinging the censer and coming out in his surplice with a candle at the reading of the gospel, but also stealing the wax candle-ends, drinking the wine after communion, and sometimes making grimaces at the funny deacon and sending him into fits of laughter, so that once he was solemnly sent away from the altar by the priest, a magnificent and plump greybeard, strikingly like the picture of the god of Sabaoth behind the altar. He went along all the old streets, and purposely lingered in front of the houses where first of all had come to him the naive and childish languishments of love. He went into the courtyards and up the staircases, hardly recognizing any of them, so much alteration and rebuilding had taken place in the quarter of a century of his absence, and he noticed with irritation and surprise that his staled and life-wearied soul remained cold and unmoved and did not reflect in itself the old familiar grief for the past, that gentle grief, so bright, so calm, reflective and submissive. "'Yes, yes, it's old age,' he repeated to himself, nodding his head sadly. "'Old age, old age, it can't be helped.' After he left Moscow, he was kept in Kiev for a whole day on business, and only arrived at Odessa at the beginning of Holy Week but it had been bad weather for some days, and Voznitsyn, who was a very bad sailor, could not make up his mind to embark. It was only on the morning of Easter Eve that the weather became fine and the sea calm. At six o'clock in the evening the steamer, Grand Duke Alexis, left the harbour. Voznitsyn had no one to see him off, for which he was thankful. He had no patience with the somewhat hypocritical and always difficult comedy of farewell, when God knows why one stands a full half-hour at the side of the boat and looks down upon the people standing on the pier, smiling constrained smiles, throwing kisses, calling out from time to time in a theatrical tone foolish and meaningless phrases for the benefit of the bystanders, till at last, with a sigh of relief, one feels the steamer begin slowly and heavily to move away. There were very few passengers on board, and the majority of them were third-class people. In the first class there were only two others besides himself, a lady and her daughter, as the steward informed him. That's good, thought he to himself. Everything promised a smooth and easy voyage. His cabin was excellent, large and well-lighted, with two divans and no upper berths at all. The sea, though gently tossing, grew gradually calmer, and the ship did not roll. At sunset, however, there was a fresh breeze on deck. Voznitsyn slept that night with open windows, and more soundly than he had slept for many months, perhaps for a year past. When the boat arrived at Eupatoria, he was awakened by the noise of the cranes, and by the running of the sailors on the deck. He got up, dressed quickly, ordered a glass of tea, and went above. The steamer was at anchor in a half-transparent mist of a milky rose tint, pierced by the golden rays of the rising sun. Scarcely noticeable in the distance, the flat shore lay glimmering. 
The sea was gently lapping the steamer's sides. There was a marvellous odour of fish, pitch, and seaweed. From a barge alongside they were lading packages and bales. The captain's directions rang out clearly in the pure air of morning. Mina, Vera, Vera, Pomayu, stop! When the barge had gone off and the steamer began to move again, Voznitsin went down into the dining saloon. A strange sight met his gaze. The tables were placed flat against the walls of the long room and were decorated with gay flowers and covered with Easter fare. There were lambs roasted whole, and turkeys, with their long necks supported by unseen rods and wire, raised their foolish heads on high. Their thin necks were bent into the form of an interrogation mark, and they trembled and shook with every movement of the steamer. They might have been strange antediluvian beasts, like the brontosauri or ichthyori one sees in pictures, lying there upon the large dishes, their legs bent under them, their heads on their twisted necks, looking around with a comical and cautious wariness. The clear sunlight streamed through the portholes and made golden circles of light on the tablecloths, transforming the colours of the Easter eggs into purple and sapphire, and making the flowers, hyacinths, pansies, tulips, violets, wallflowers, forget-me-nots, glow with living fire. The other first-class passenger also came down to tea. Voznitsin threw a passing glance at her. She was neither young nor beautiful, but she had a tall, well-preserved, rather stout figure, and was well and simply dressed in an ample light-coloured cloak, with silk collar and cuffs. Her head was covered with a light blue, semi-transparent gauze scarf. She drank her tea and read a book at the same time, a French book, Voznitsin judged, by its small compact shape and pale yellow cover. There was something strangely and remotely familiar about her, not so much in her face as in the turn of her neck and the lift of her eyebrows when she cast an answering glance at him. But this unconscious impression was soon dispersed and forgotten. The heat of the saloon soon sent the passengers on deck, and they sat down on the seats on the sheltered side of the boat. The lady continued to read, though she often let her book fall on to her knee while she gazed upon the sea, on the dolphins sporting there, on the distant cliffs of the shore, purple in colour or covered with a scant verdure. Voznitsin began to pace up and down the deck, turning when he reached the cabin. Once, as he passed the lady, she looked up at him attentively with a kind of questioning curiosity and once more it seemed to him that he had met her before somewhere. Little by little this insistent feeling began to disquiet him, and he felt that the lady was experiencing the same feelings. But try as he would, he could not remember meeting her before. Suddenly, passing her for the twentieth time, he almost involuntarily stopped in front of her, saluted in military fashion, and lightly clicking his spurs together, said, pardon my boldness, but I can't get rid of a feeling that I know you, or rather that long ago I used to know you. She was quite a plain woman, of blonde almost red colouring, grey hair, though this was only noticeable at a near view owing to its original light colour, pale eyelashes over blue eyes, and a faded freckled face. Her mouth only seemed fresh, being full and rosy, with beautifully curved lips. And I also, said she, just fancy, I've been sitting here and wondering where we could have met. My name is Lvova. Does that remind you of anything? I'm sorry to say it doesn't, answered he, but my name is Voznitsin. The lady's eyes gleamed suddenly with a gay and familiar smile, and Voznitsin saw that she knew him at once. Voznitsin! Kolya Voznitsin! she cried joyfully, holding out her hand to him. Is it possible I didn't recognize you? Lvova, of course, is my married name. But no, no, you will remember me in time. Think, Moscow, Barisoglaby Street, the house belonging to the church. Well, don't you remember your school chum, Arkasha Yurlov? Voznitsin's hand trembled as he pressed hers, 
a flash of memory enlightened him well i never it can't be lenotchka i beg your pardon elena 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 vladimirovna she put in you've forgotten but you kolya you're just the same kolya awkward shy touchy kolya how strange for us to meet like this do sit down how glad i am yes muttered Voznishin. the world is really so small that every one must of necessity meet every one else a by no means original thought but tell me all that has happened how is arkasha and alexandra milievna and olechka at school Voznishin had only been intimate with one of his companions arkasha yurlov every sunday he had leave he used to visit the family and at easter and christmas time he had sometimes spent his holidays with them before the time came for them to go to college arkasha had fallen ill and had been ordered away into the country and from that time Voznishin had lost sight of him many years ago he had heard by chance that lenotchka had been betrothed to an officer having the unusual name of jenishek who had done a thing at once foolish and unexpected shot himself arkasha died at our country house in eighteen ninety answered the lady of cancer and mother only lived a year after olechka took her medical degree and is now a doctor in the serdobsky district before that she was assistant in our village of Zemakino. she had never wished to marry though she had many good offers i've been married twenty years said she a gleam of a smile on her compressed lips i'm quite an old woman my husband has an estate in the country and is a member of the provincial council he hasn't received many honours but he's an honest fellow and a good husband is not a drunkard neither plays cards nor runs after women as others do god be praised for that i do you remember elena vladimirovna how i was in love with you at one time voznishin broke in suddenly she smiled and her face at once wore a look of youth voznishin saw for a moment the gleam of the gold stopping in her teeth foolishness just lad's love but you weren't in love with me at all you fell in love with the sinelnikovs all four of them one after the other when the eldest girl married you placed your heart at the feet of the next sister and so on aha you were just a little jealous eh remarked Voznishin with jocular self-satisfaction oh not at all you were like arkasha's brother afterwards later when you were about seventeen perhaps i was a little vexed to think you had changed towards me you know it's ridiculous but girls have hearts like women we may not love a silent adorer but we are jealous if he pays attention to others but that's all nonsense tell me more about yourself where you live and what you do he told her of his life at college in the army about the war and his present position no he had never married at first he had feared poverty and the responsibility of a family and now it was too late he had had flirtations of course and even some serious romances the conversation ceased after a while and they sat silent looking at one another with tender tear-dimmed eyes in voznishin's memory the long past of thirty years ago came swiftly again before him he had known lenotchka when he was eleven years old she had been a naughty fidgety sort of girl fond of telling tales and liking to make trouble her face was covered with freckles she had long arms and legs pale eyelashes and disorderly red hair hanging about her face in long wisps her sister olechka was different she had always kept apart and behaved like a sensible girl on holidays they all went together to dances at the assembly rooms to the theatre the circus to the skating rink they got up christmas parties and children's plays together they coloured eggs at easter and dressed up at christmas they quarrelled and carried on together like young puppies there were three years of that lenotchka used to go away every summer with her people to the country house at jamakino 
and that year, when she returned to Moscow in the autumn, Voznitsin opened both eyes and mouth in astonishment. She was changed. You couldn't say that she was beautiful, but there was something in her face more wonderful than actual beauty, a rosy radiant blossoming of the feminine being in her. It is so sometimes. God knows how the miracle takes place, but in a few weeks an awkward, undersized, gawky schoolgirl will develop suddenly into a charming maiden. Lenotchka's face still kept her summer sunburn, under which her ardent young blood flowed gaily. Her shoulders had filled out, her figure rounded itself, and her soft breasts had a firm outline. All her body had become willowy, graceful, gracious and their relations towards one another had changed also. They became different after one Saturday evening, when the two of them, frolicking together before church service in a dimly lighted room, began to wrestle together and fight. The windows were wide open, and from the garden came the clear freshness of autumn and a slight whiny odour of fallen leaves, and slowly one after another rang out the sounds of the church bells they struggled together. Their arms were round each other, so that their bodies were pressed closely together, and they were breathing in each other's faces. Suddenly Lenotchka, her face flaming crimson even in the darkening twilight, her eyes dilated, began to whisper angrily and confusedly. "'Let me go! Let go! I don't want to!' adding with a malicious gleam in her wet eyes, "'Nasty, horrid boy!' The nasty, horrid boy released her and stood there, awkwardly stretching out his trembling arms. His legs trembled also, and his forehead was wet with a sudden perspiration. He had just now felt in his arms the slender, responsive waist of a woman, broadening out so wonderfully to the rounded hips. He had felt on his bosom the pliant, yielding contact of her firm, high, girlish breasts, and breathed the perfume of her body that pleasant intoxicating scent of opening poplar buds and young shoots of black currant bushes which one smells on a clear damp evening of spring after a slight shower when the sky and the rain pools flame with crimson and the may beetles hum in the air thus began for voznitsin that year of love languishment of bitter passionate dreams of secret and solitary tears he became wild, unsociable, rude and awkward in consequence of his torturing shyness. He was always knocking over chairs and catching his clothes on the furniture, upsetting the tea-table with all the cups and saucers. "'Our Kolinka's always getting into trouble,' said Lenotchka's mother good-naturedly. Lenotchka laughed at him, but he knew nothing of it. He was continually behind her, watching her draw or write or embroider and looking at the curve of her neck with a strange mixture of happiness and torture, watching her white skin and flowing golden hair, seeing how her brown school-blouse moved with her breathing, becoming large and wrinkling up into little pleats when she drew in her breath, then filling out and becoming tight and elastic and round again. The sight of her girlish wrists and pretty arms, and the scent of opening poplar buds about her, remained with the boy and occupied his thoughts in class in church in detention rooms in all his notebooks and textbooks voznitsin drew beautifully twined initials e and y and cut them with a knife on the lid of his desk in the middle of a pierced and flaming heart the girl with her woman's instinct no doubt guessed his silent adoration but in her eyes he was too every day too much one of the family for him she had suddenly been transformed into a blooming, dazzling, fragrant wonder, but in her sight he was still the same impetuous boy as before, with a deep voice and hard rough hands, wearing a tight uniform and wide trousers. She coquetted innocently with her schoolboy friends, and with the young son of the priest at the church, and, like a kitten sharpening its claws, she sometimes found it amusing to throw on Voznitsin a swift, burning, cunning glance. But if he, in a momentary forgetfulness, squeezed her hand too tightly, she would threaten him with a rosy finger and say meaningly, "'Take care, Kolya, I shall tell mother.' 
and Voznitsin would shiver with unfeigned terror. It was no wonder that Kolya had to spend two years in the sixth form. No wonder, either, that in the summer he fell in love with the eldest of the Sinyelnikov girls, with whom he had once danced at a party. But at Easter his full heart of love knew a moment of heavenly blessedness. On Easter Eve he went with the Yurlovs to the Boris Oglebsky church, where Alexandra Milievna had an honoured place, with her own kneeling mat and soft folding chair and somehow or other he contrived to come home alone with Lenotchka. The mother and Olechka stayed for the consecration of the Easter cakes, and Lenotchka, Arkasha, and Kolya came out of church together. But Arkasha diplomatically vanished. He disappeared as suddenly as if the earth had opened and swallowed him up. The two young people found themselves alone. They went arm in arm through the crowd, their young legs moving easily and swiftly. Both were overcome by the beauty of the night, the joyous hymns, the multitude of lights, the Easter kisses, the smiles and greetings in the church. Outside there was a cheerful crowd of people. The dark and tender sky was full of brightly twinkling stars. The scent of moist young leaves was wafting from gardens, and they, too, were unexpectedly so near to one another they seemed lost together in the crowd, and they were out at an unusually late hour. Pretending to himself that it was by accident, Voznitsin pressed Lenotchka's elbow to his side, and she answered with a barely noticeable movement in return. He repeated the secret caress, and she again responded. Then in the darkness he felt for her fingertips and gently stroked them, and her hand made no objection, was not snatched away. And so they came to the gate of the church-house. Arkasha had left the little gate open for them. Narrow wooden planks placed over the mud led up to the house between two rows of spreading old lime-trees. When the gate closed after them, Voznitsin caught Lenotchka's hand and began to kiss her fingers, so warm, so soft, so full of life. Lenotchka, I love you, I love you. He put his arms around her and kissed her in the darkness, somewhere just below her ear. His hat fell off to the ground, but he did not stop to pick it up. He kissed the girl's cool cheek and whispered as in a dream, Lenotchka, I love you. I love you. No, no, she said in a whisper, and hearing the whisper he sought her lips. No, no, let me go, let me. Dear lips of hers, half childish, simple, innocent lips. When he kissed her she made no objection, yet she did not return his kisses. She breathed in a touching manner, quickly, deeply, submissively. Down his cheeks there flowed cool tears tears of rapture. And when he drew his lips away from hers, and looked up into the sky, the stars shining through the lime branches seemed to dance and come towards one another, to meet and swim together in silvery clusters, seen through his flowing tears. Lenotchka, I love you. Let me go. Lenotchka! But suddenly she cried out angrily, let me go, you nasty, horrid boy. You'll see. I'll tell mother everything. I'll tell her all about it. Indeed I will." She didn't say anything to her mother, but after that night she never allowed Voznitsin to be alone with her. And then the summer time came. And do you remember, Elena Vladimirovna, how one beautiful Easter night two young people kissed one another just inside the church-house gate? asked Voznitsin. "'No, I don't remember anything. Nasty, horrid boy,' said the lady, smiling gently. "'But look, here comes my daughter. You must make her acquaintance.' "'Lenotchka, this is Nikolai Ivanitch Voznitsin, my old, old friend. I knew him as a child. And this is my Lenotchka. She's just exactly the same age as I was on that Easter night.' Big Lenotchka and little Lenotchka, said Voznitsin. No, old Lenotchka and young Lenotchka, she answered, simply and quietly. Lenotchka was very much like her mother, but taller and more beautiful than she had been in her youth. 
Her hair was not red, but the color of a hazelnut with a brilliant luster. Her dark eyebrows were finely and clearly outlined, her mouth full and sensitive, fresh and beautiful. The young girl was interested in the floating light ships, and Voznitsin explained their construction and use. Then they talked about stationary lighthouses, the depth of the Black Sea, about divers, about collisions of steamers, and so on. Voznitsin could talk well, and the young girl listened to him with lightly parted lips, never taking her eyes from his face. And he, the longer he looked at her, the more his heart was overcome by a sweet and tender melancholy, sympathy for himself, pleasure in her, in this new Lenotchka, and a quiet thankfulness to the elder one. It was this very feeling for which he had thirsted in Moscow, but clearer, brighter, purified from all self-love. When the young girl went off to look at the Kirshon Monastery, he took the elder Lenotchka's hand and kissed it gently. "'Life is wise, and we must submit to her laws,' he said thoughtfully. "'But life is beautiful, too. It is an eternal rising from the dead. You and I will pass away and vanish out of sight. But from our bodies, from our thoughts and actions, from our minds, our inspiration and our talents, there will arise, as from ashes, a new Lenotchka and a new Kolya Voznitsin. All is connected, all linked together. I shall depart, and yet I shall also remain. But one must love life and follow her guidance. We are all alive together, the living and the dead. He bent down once more to kiss her hand, and she kissed him tenderly on his white-haired brow. They looked at one another, and their eyes were wet with tears. They smiled gently, sadly, tenderly. End of Story 3 Story Four of A Slav Soul and Other Stories by Alexander Kuprin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Idiot. We were seated in a little park, driven there by the unbearable heat of the noonday sun. It was much cooler there than in the streets, where the paving stones, steeped in the rays of the July sun, burnt the soles of one's feet, and the walls of the buildings seemed red hot. The fine scorching dust of the roadway did not penetrate through the close border of leafy old limes and spreading chestnuts, the latter with their long, upright pyramids of rosy flowers looking like gigantic imperial candelabra. The park was full of frolicsome, well-dressed children, the older ones playing with hoops and skipping ropes, chasing one another, or going together in pairs, their arms entwined as they walked about with an air of importance stepping quickly upon the sidewalk. The little ones played at choosing colours. My lady sent me a hundred roubles, and King of the Castle. And then a group of all the smallest ones gathered together on a large heap of warm yellow sand, moulding it into buckwheat cakes and Easter loaves. The nurses stood round in groups, gossiping about their masters and mistresses. The governesses sat stiffly upright on the benches, deep in their reading or their needlework. Suddenly the children stopped their playing, and began to gaze intently in the direction of the entrance gate. We also turned to look. A tall bearded peasant was wheeling in before him a bath-chair in which sat a pitiful, helpless being, a boy of about eighteen or twenty years, with a flabby, pale face, thick, wet, crimson hanging lips, and the appearance of an idiot. The bearded peasant pushed the chair past us, and disappeared down a side-path. I noticed as he passed that the enormous sharp-pointed head of the boy moved from side to side, and that at each movement of the chair it fell towards his shoulder or drooped helplessly in front of him. "'Poor man!' exclaimed my companion, in a gentle voice. I heard such deep and sincere sympathy in his words that I involuntarily looked at him in astonishment. I had known Zimina for a long time. He was a strong, good-natured, jolly, virile type of man, serving in one of the regiments quartered in our town. To tell the truth, I shouldn't have expected from him such sincere compassion towards a stranger's misfortune. 
Poor, of course he is, but I shouldn't call him a man, said I, wishing to get into conversation with Zemina. Why wouldn't you? asked he in his turn. Well, it's difficult to say, but surely it's clear to everybody. An idiot has none of the higher impulses and virtues which distinguish man from the animal, no reason or speech or will. A dog or a cat possesses these qualities in a much higher degree. But Zemina interrupted me. "'Pardon me, please,' said he. "'I am deeply convinced, on the contrary, that idiots are not lacking in human instincts. These instincts are only clouded over. They exist deep below their animal feelings. You see, I once had an experience which gives me, I think, the right to say this. The remembrance of it will never leave me, and every time I see such an afflicted person, I feel touched almost to tears. If you'll allow me, I'll tell you why the sight of an idiot moves me to such compassion." I hastened to beg him to tell me his story, and he began. In the year 18... In the early autumn, I went to Petersburg to sit for an examination at the Academy of the General Staff. I stopped in the first hotel I came to, at the corner of Nevsky Prospect and the Fontanka. From my windows I could see the bronze horses on the parapet of the Anichka Bridge. They were always wet and gleaming, as if they had been covered over with new oilcloth. I often drew them on the marble window-seats of my room. Petersburg struck me as an unpleasant place. It seemed to be always enveloped in a melancholy grey veil of drizzling rain. But when I went into the academy for the first time, I was overwhelmed and overawed by its grandeur. I remember now its immense broad staircase with marble balustrades, its high-roofed amphilades, its severely proportioned lecture hall, and its waxed parquet floor gleaming like a mirror upon which my provincial feet stepped warily. There were four hundred officers there that day. Against the modest background of green Armenian uniforms there flashed the clattering swords of the cuirassiers, the scarlet breasts of the lancers, the white jackets of the cavalry guards, waving plumes, the gold of eagles on helmets, the various colours of facings, the silver of swords. These officers were all my rivals, and as I watched them in pride and agitation, I pulled at the place where I supposed my moustache would grow by and by. When a busy colonel of the general staff, with his portfolio under his arm, hurried past us, we shy foot-soldiers stepped on one side with reverent awe. The examination was to last over a month. I knew no one in all Petersburg, and in the evening, returning to my lodging, I experienced the dullness and wearisomeness of solitude. It was no good talking to any of my companions. They were all immersed in signs and tangents, in the qualities determining good positions for a battleground, in calculations about the declination of a projectile. Suddenly I remembered that my father had advised me to seek out in Petersburg our distant relative, Alexandra Ivanova Grachevna, and go and visit her. I got a directory, found her address, and set out for a place somewhere on the Gorokovaya. After some little difficulty I found Alexandra Ivanova's room. She was living in her sister's house. I opened the door and stood there, hardly seeing anything at first. A stout woman was standing with her back to me, near the single small window of dull green glass. She was bending over a smoky paraffin stove. The room was filled with the odour of paraffin and burning fat. The woman turned round and saw me, and from a corner a barefooted boy, wearing a loose belted blouse, jumped up and ran quickly towards me. I looked closely at him, and saw at once that he was an idiot, and though I did not recoil before him, in reality there was a feeling in my heart like that of fear. The idiot looked unintelligently at me, uttering strange sounds, something like, Urli, Urli, Urli. "'Don't be afraid, he won't touch it,' said the woman to the idiot, coming forward, and then to me. "'What can I do for you?' she asked. I gave my name and reminded her of my father. She was glad to see me, her face brightened up, she exclaimed in surprise and began to apologize for not having the room in order. The idiot boy came closer to me, and cried out more loudly, Orly, Orly! 
this is my boy he's been like that from birth said alexandra ivanovna with a sad smile what of it it's the will of god his name is stepan hearing his name the idiot cried out in a shrill bird-like voice papan alexandra ivanovna patted him caressingly on the shoulder yes yes stepan stepan you see he guessed we were speaking about him and so he introduced himself papan cried the idiot again turning his eyes first on his mother and then on me in order to show some interest in the boy i said to him how do you do stepan and took him by the hand it was cold puffy lifeless i felt a certain aversion and only out of politeness went on i suppose he's about sixteen oh no answered the mother everybody thinks he's about sixteen but he's over twenty-nine his beard and moustache have never grown we talked together alexandra ivanovna was a quiet timid woman weighed down by need and misfortune her sharp struggle against poverty had entirely killed all boldness of thought in her and all interest in anything outside the narrow bounds of this struggle she complained to me of the high price of meat and about the impudence of the cab drivers told me of some people who had won money in a lottery and envied the happiness of rich people all the time of our conversation stepan kept his eyes fixed on me he was apparently struck by and interested in my military overcoat three times he put out his hand stealthily to touch the shining buttons but drew it back each time as if he were afraid is it possible your stepan cannot say even one word i asked alexandra ivanovna shook her head sadly no he can't speak he has a few words of his own but they're not really words just mutterings for example he calls himself papan when he wants something to eat he says mnia he calls money tiki stepan she continued turning to her son where is your teki show us your teki stepan jumped up quickly from his chair ran into a dark corner and crouched down on his heels i heard the jingling of some copper coins and the boy's voice saying orly orly but this time in a growling threatening tone he's afraid explained the mother though he doesn't understand what money is he won't let anyone touch it he won't even let me well we won't touch your money we won't touch it she went to her son and soothed him i began to visit them frequently stepan interested me and an idea came to me to try and cure him according to the system of a certain swiss doctor who tried to cure his feeble-minded patients by the slow road of logical development he has a few weak impressions of the outer world and of the connection between phenomena i thought can one not combine two or three of these ideas and so give a fourth a fifth and so on is it not possible by persistent exercise to strengthen and broaden this poor mind a little i brought him a doll dressed as a coachman he was much pleased with it and laughed and exclaimed showing the doll and saying papan the doll however seemed to awaken some doubt in his mind and that same evening stepan who was usually well disposed to all that was small and weak, tried to break the doll's head on the floor. Then I brought him pictures, tried to interest him in boxes of bricks, and talked to him, naming the different objects and pointing them out to him. But either the Swiss doctor's system was not a good one, or I didn't know how to put it into practice. Stepan's development seemed to make no progress at all. He was very fond of me in those days, when i came to visit them he ran to meet me uttering rapturous cries he never took his eyes off me and when i ceased to pay him special attention he came up and licked my hands my shoes my uniform just like a dog when i went away he stood at the window for a long time and cried so pitifully that the other lodgers in the house complained of him to the landlady but my personal affairs were in a bad way i failed at the examination failed unusually badly in the last but one examination in fortifications nothing remained but to collect my belongings and go back to my regiment i don't think that in all my life i shall ever forget that dreadful moment when 
Coming out of the lecture hall, I walked across the great vestibule of the academy. Good Lord! I felt so small, so pitiful and so humbled, walking down those broad steps covered with grey felt carpet, having a crimson stripe at the side and a white linen tread down the middle. It was necessary to get away as quickly as possible. I was urged to this by financial considerations. In my purse I had only ten kopecks and one ticket for a dinner at a student's restaurant. I thought to myself, I must get my dismissal quickly and set out at once. Oh, the irony of that word, dismissal! But it seemed the most difficult thing in the world. From the Chancellor of the Academy I was sent to the General Staff, thence to the Commandant's office, then to the local intendant, then back to the Academy, and at last to the Treasury. All these places were open only at special times, some from nine to twelve, some from three to five. I was late at all of them, and my position began to appear critical. When I used my dinner ticket, I had thoughtlessly squandered my ten kopecks also. Next day, when I felt the pangs of hunger, I resolved to sell my textbooks. Thick Baron Bago, adapted by Bremiker, bound, I sold for twenty-five kopecks. Professor Lobko, for twenty. Solid General Durope, no one would buy. For two days I was half-starved. On the third day there only remained to me three kopecks. I screwed up my courage and went to ask a loan from some of my companions. But they all excused themselves by saying there was a Torricellian vacuum in their pockets, and only one acknowledged having a few roubles, but he never lent money. As he explained with a gentle smile, Loan oft loses both itself and friend, as Shakespeare says in one of his immortal works. Three kopecks. I indulged in tragic reflections. Should I spend them all at once on a box of ten cigarettes, or should I wait until my hunger became unbearable, and then buy bread? How wise I was to decide on the latter. Towards evening I was as hungry as Robinson Crusoe on his island, and I went out on to the Nevsky Prospect. Ten times I passed and repassed Filipov's the baker's, devouring with my eyes the immense loaves of bread in the windows. Some had yellow crust, some red, and some were strewn with poppy seed. At last I resolved to go in. Some schoolboys stood there eating hot pies, holding them in scraps of grey greasy paper. I felt a hatred against them for their good fortune. "'What would you like?' asked the shopman. I put on an indifferent air, and answered superciliously, "'Cut me off a pound of black bread.' I was far from being at my ease, while the man skilfully cut the bread with his broad knife. And suddenly I thought to myself, "'Suppose it's more than two and a half kopecks a pound. What shall I do if the man cuts it overweight? I know it's possible to owe five or ten roubles in a restaurant, and say to the waiter, "'Put it down to my account, please.' but what can one do if one hasn't enough to buy one kopeck? Hurrah! The bread cost exactly three kopecks. I shifted about from one foot to another while it was being wrapped up in paper. As soon as I got out of the shop and felt in my pocket the soft warmth of the bread, I wanted to cry out for joy and begin to munch it, as children do those crusts which they steal from the table, after a long day's romping, to eat as they lie in their beds and I couldn't restrain myself. Even in the street I thrust into my mouth two large tasty morsels. Yes, I tell you all this in almost a cheerful tone, but I was far from cheerful then. Add to my torture of hunger the stinging shame of failure, the near prospect of being the laughing-stock of my regimental companions, the charming amiability of the official on whom depended my cursed dismissal. I tell you frankly, in those days I was face to face all the time with the thought of suicide. Next day my hunger again seemed unbearable. I went along to Alexandra Ivanovna. As soon as Stepan saw me he went into an ecstasy. He cried out, jumped about me, and licked my coat-sleeve. When at length I sat down he placed himself near me on the floor and pressed up against my legs. Alexandra Ivanovna was obliged to send him away by force. It was very unpleasant to have to ask a loan from this poor woman, who herself found life so difficult, but I resolved I must do so. 
Alexandra Ivanovna, said I, I've nothing to eat. Lend me what money you can, please. She wrung her hands. My dear boy, I haven't a kopeck. Yesterday I pawned my brooch. Today I was able to buy something in the market, but tomorrow I don't know what I shall do. Can't you borrow a little from your sister? I suggested. Alexandra Ivanovna looked round with a frightened air, and whispered, almost in terror, "'What are you saying? What? Don't you know I live here on her charity? No, we'd better think of some other way of getting it.' But the more we thought, the more difficult it appeared. After a while we became silent. Evening came on, and the room was filled with a heavy, wearisome gloom. Despair and hate and hunger tortured me. I felt as if I were abandoned on the edge of the world, alone and humiliated. Suddenly something touched my side. I turned. It was Stepan. He held out to me on his palm a little pile of copper money, and said, Tecky, tecky, tecky. I did not understand. Then he threw his money on to my knee, called out once more, Tecky, and ran off into his corner. Well, why should I hide it? I wept like a child, sobbed out long and loudly. Alexandra Ivanovna wept also, out of pity and tenderness, and from his far corner Stepan uttered his pitiful, unmeaning cry of, Uli, Uli, Uli. When I became quieter I felt better. The unexpected sympathy of the idiot boy had suddenly warmed and soothed my heart, and shown me that it is possible to live, and that one ought to live, as long as there is love and compassion in the world. That is why, concluded Zimina, finishing his story, that is why I pity all these unfortunates, and why I can't deny that they are human beings. Yes, and, by the way, his sympathy brought me happiness. Now I'm very glad I didn't become a moment, that's our nickname for the officers of the general staff. Since that time I have had a full and broad life, and promises to be as full in the future. I'm superstitious about it. End of story four.